Okay, so thank you very much for the kind words, and I immensely thank Dr. Rajiv Chavla and Dr. Shalini and the entire team of CMRE for this great opportunity to discuss about the elderly patients with diabetes. And we know this lady, Marjorie Warren, who was the British surgeon, eventually turned into geriatrician and is called as the mother of modern geriatric medicine. You need to recognize that she fought really hard in UK to create a special ward for the geriatric population and created a special staff to treat these patients. And she also understood that these patients required different management compared to other patients of diabetes. So she is the one who created this concept of managing patients of diabetes in the elderly population. So the roadmap of today's discussion is to discuss about the burden of diabetes in the elderly population, why it's important to know about it and challenges in the management and the pharmaceutical approach that we require. Now, this is the uh, graph of India, which shows that the rise in the longevity in India, just to recall in 1961, we had the life expectancy of 42 years. It moved to 69 years in the 2018 and 76 years in 2050. It's expected to rise that. So the Indian population showed a threefold rise in the entire population of elderly, and if you look at the life expectancy, it was 16, 80 years, has gone up by 18 and 7 years and expected to go by 21 years and 8.5 years by 2050. So large number of the adult population we're going to see in future. And this is the burden of diabetes of the older population. We can see here about 1395 million expected diabetics by 2030. And what is the sad part of the story is 50% of these patients will be above the age of 65 years, forming a large chunk of diabetic population in that age group. We look at people with the population of the elderly people in the countries. These are five listed countries here and India stands three. So therefore we have one of the countries with a large number of elderly population that we oh. see. Uh, almost to tune of 17% of the elderly population that we see in this country. And if you see the distribution of the reported morbidities and the incidence of diabetes, depending on the residence, whereas rural urban area, you can see here in the urban area between year 2017, 2018, this is a national sample survey, which looked at the young, old, 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 and oldest old, and you can see here somewhere about 30 to 35 percent to 25.65%, and average about 28% of the population that we see in India is above the age of 65 years, especially in the urban region. So again, contributing the big chunk of patients of elderly population. Why it's important to consider the elderly as a separate group? And that's because of the pathophysiology. We know the aging contributes to the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes, both directly through the decreased beta cell function, which reduces the insulin secretion and indirectly by increasing the insulin resistance through the obesity and other risk factors. We can see here as a part of aging, there is also sarcopenia, there is a skeletal muscle dysfunction, frailty, and so on and so forth, which brings about decreased insulin secretion. At the same time, there are risk factors for insulin resistance, namely the the central obesity, the ectopic adiposity, chronic inflammation, beta cell dysfunction, hyperglucagonemia, all these contribute insulin resistance and eventually result in type 2 diabetes with chronic hyperglycemia and the microvascular and the macrovascular complication. Furthermore, as you see the aging population, the aging itself along with obesity leads to progressive development of worsening of type 2 diabetes. And this is because of the cellular senescence in the various organs, which accelerates the pathophysiological process of the consequences of adiposity and increase insulin resistance and the pro-inflammatory pathways in the adipose tissue and the muscle results into decreased skeletal muscle mass and decreased beta cell function. And that eventually increases the chronic hyperglycemia, which gets into the macro and the microvascular complications and comorbid conditions which are associated with elderly populations promote the adverse effect of the risk factors of aging and or obesity. So this is what we see in elderly population. 60% of the elderly population have at least one comorbid condition like cognitive decline, polypharmacy, disability, depression, 
urinary incompetence, hearing and visual impairment, falls and fractures, and cardiovascular disorders are the concurrent illnesses. So, one of these, more of the four concurrent illnesses and comorbid conditions along with diabetes contribute to the complexity of the issues in the patients of diabetes management. If you look at the diagnosis in patients who are elderly, it is two hours plasma glucose of oral glucose tolerance test is more reliable than the fasting plasma glucose because fasting plasma glucose can be normal in the early part of diabetes and the A1C is specific but less sensitive, especially in elderly population. We know that elderly populations have a very abnormal A1C value, so the A1C values cannot be taken as a gold standard to make a diagnosis of diabetes in elderly population. Therefore, we need to have a two hours plasma glucose on oral glucose tolerance test as the capture for the undiagnosed diabetes. The presentation also quite peculiar. They do not have osmotic symptoms because there's an increase in the threshold and they're quite often asymptomatic in 50% of the patients and remaining 50% of the patients present to you as a non-specific manifestation, which is contributing in the symptom like fatigue, lethargy, and which can be mistaken for the aging population. In addition to that, you need to screen the vascular disease, you need to screen physical and neuropathic function and the mental and cognitive functions. Alan Sinclair was uh, having this particular article, which is very interesting in that it says that the reciprocal relationship with the diabetes and synergistically related one another. What it means is there is a kind of a, a correlation between the mental dysfunction and the physical and neuropathic complications along with the vascular disease. So each of them initiate or worsen the problem of mental dysfunction to the physical neuropathic complication. There's a bi-directional relationship in that. Like dementia, depression, behavioral anxiety disorders can worsen the sarcopenia, frailty, in proximal neuropathy. And both of them put together increases the vascular complications, both the micro and the microvascular complications, resulting into disability, which could be visual loss, immobility, falls and fractures, and more than 12 months of daily mental health symptoms. So therefore, these are the problems which elderly patients have, and one need to understand all these when you plan a treatment for them. So the challenges for treatment of these elderly populations are the incidence and progression of diabetes and its complications, coexisting geriatric syndromes, and facility setting and processes are very important when you look at these manifestations. When you see patients of elderly, the challenges are the comorbid and geriatric syndrome, for example, the delirium, the progressive cognitive decline, which tells the patient to have irregular meals. So therefore we need to have a simplified modification of regimen and disintensification of treatment, which is a very important concept in elderly population, avoidance of hypoglycemia, which is again a major concern. Frailty and decreased mobility, which also causes deconditioning, pressure ulcers, and required assistance with feeding and toileting, and they have an increased tendency to fall. And therefore, we need to manage strategies for optimized activities. Repositioning of the mobility is impaired to avoid pressure ulcers, and of course, physical and occupational therapy. Depression could be either because of staying alone or losing a partner, which also contributes to either weight gain or weight loss the refusal of activities and glucose monitoring as a part of depression. And therefore, these patients require a physical and social activities and they require psychological counsel counseling and assess to treat depression. Skin infection, foot problems also very common. And therefore, there is a consequence of hyperglycemia, poor intake and weight loss. And of course, the impaired mobility, which requires a management strategies by way of increased glucose monitoring, increased diabetes modification, nutrition consultation, and regular skin and foot examination. Is the triglycemic control is beneficial in elderly population? Well, the UKPDA says it does reduce the microvascular complication. And of course, the macrovascular did not show benefit in the early part of the study. The subsequent part of the study did show some benefits in the macrovascular complication. The ACOT study has the potential to cause harm to these patients. And therefore, elderly population who are frail, who tend to have the falls and risk of hypoglycemia, 
does not improve the quality of life. In these patients, a very tight control of diabetes is harmful and does not improve the quality of health anymore. Sarcopenia is a very important aspect of the elderly population and this is contributed by the aging process itself because we know about 3% of the loss of the muscle mass after the age of 50 years is quite accelerated in patients of diabetes resulting to sarcopenia and plus because of diabetes itself, because of oxidative stress and because of the poor glycemic control and the mitochondrial dysfunction, we get accelerated risk of sarcopenia in these patients. It contributes to the functional impairment and increased risk of mortality. And elderly patient diabetes has twofold risk of developing sarcopenia. And therefore, when you treat these patients, we need to have certain drugs which reduce the risk of sarcopenia. For example, like DP inhibitors are drugs which reduce the incidence of sarcopenia. So diabetes is associated with obesity-induced sarcopenia, which is again a very important part in sarcopenia. And that's because of the lack of physical activity, low grade inflammation, insulin resistance, and resulting into sarcopenic obesity. And diabetes and sarcopenic obesity possibly have a strong association and incretins may be beneficial in diabetes due to the impact on the weight reduction. But mind you, in elderly population, weight reduction can be sometimes dangerous because the bones become very fragile, the incidence of fractures are very high. So therefore, when you consider the weight loss in elderly population, we be very careful in giving a gradual weight loss. So the intensification of treatment in diabetes is the important aspect when you look at the elderly population. And this includes decreasing the prescription of the drugs and that improves the quality of life in elderly population because these people have the various problems. For example, the short life expectancy, low cognition, low functional status, patient preference for a less intensive care, and the long duration of diabetes, vascular complications, and the risk of hypoglycemia. So we need to bring about de-prescribing antibiotics, reduce monitoring to make the life comfortable, switching to drugs which does not produce hypoglycemia, de-prescribing other medications, for example, statins can be de-prescribed, reducing diabetic specific assessment can also be reduced. So this is the algorithm. And this algorithm uh, says about how to bring about de-prescription or reduction of the insulin. First of all, the patient is taking a mixed insulin, make it 70% of the basal insulin. And if the patient is taking any basal insulin at nighttime, shift that basal insulin in the morning time. If the patient is taking mealtime insulin, the dose 22. is less than 10 units, please um, stop it. If it's taking more than 10 units, reduce the dose significantly so that the risk of hypoglycemia is far minimum. And therefore, these patients should be given the injection in the morning. And of course, you also monitor the patient's fasting blood sugar, though the injection is given in the morning, and therefore titrate the dose as per the patient's need. Just to remind you here, the rate of titration here, you have to be very little gentle. You will take at least one week to 10 days to escalate or discrete the dose in these patients go gently over their uh, escalation or de-escalation because the risk of hypoglycemia is pretty high. The female population in the menopausal state also have their own problems. And there they have a reduction in the BMR as soon as they have the menopause sets in that causes obesity and that visceral obesity causes increased insulin resistance. They also have endothelial dysfunction, which increases the angiotensin two level and they have a lot of vasomotor symptoms and they have depression as a part of their men menopause. And both of them contribute to coronary and the cerebral vascular disease. So therefore careful monitoring and treatment of blood pressure and control lipids in the glucose and is very important. You need to have a good lifestyle modification, good glycemic control, management of blood pressure, lipid management, antiplatelet therapy. So this, the time that is given to me does not permit me to go into details about all. But remember, these are the multiple facets that you have to look into th in the patients who have elderly. The inpatients, we heard a fantastic lecture by Dr. Agarwal. And here it talks about the elderly population having three times more risk of getting admission in the hospital, either for management of hyperglycemia, and that causes increased mortality and morbidity, increased length of the stay, and increased risk of infection and overall complications. And there's also risk of admission to the hospital because of hypoglycemia, because of the intensified glycemic control, overuse of insulin and sulfonylureas, 
and insufficient patient education. So patient-centric individualization is important. Insulin therapy, of course, remains the mainstay of therapy in the hospitalized patients. Though citagliptin, as Dr. Sanjay was mentioning, could be used in some of these patients with the basal insulin. So let's look at the last part of my talk, the pharmacological approach. And therefore, the various guidelines says that you need to <clears throat> tailor the treatment of the patient's need. If the patient is healthy, you can have the good control of glycemia. The patient is frail and multiple comorbid conditions. Then you need to, you need to loosen the control of diabetes, get the even c below 8%. The American geriatric assumption said between 7.5 to 9%. The ACE, of course, maintains more than 6.5%. And the ACP says 7 to 8%. And there are no, no specific targets for elderly population with frailty. And this is the management in short. Those who are independent, you need to get adequate nutrition. You need to get a high-protein diet, resistant exercises, tight glycemic control if they are otherwise very healthy. And you can achieve a tighter control if the patient has no comorbid conditions and no risk of hypoglycemia. Partially dependent patients, of course, nutrition is important. Protein intake is important because uh, you need to have the muscle loss be prevented. But resistance exercise is a good way of maintaining the muscle mass two times a week. Here there is a flexible glycemic control in 7 to 8%. And here they maintain function to prevent risk of disabilities. And totally dependent patients, you need, of course, the protein intake to prevent muscle loss. You have a flexible A1C of 8 to 9% and ensure treatment safety and the controlled symptoms maintain the good quality of life and prevent excessive loss of lower limb performances. So that's what we do based on the patient's need, and we need to tailor the treatment as per the patient need. The American Diabetic Association had a similar recommendation. They said risk of hypoglycemia is pretty high. Be careful about it. Over-treatment in diabetes is very commonly seen in diabetic patients, and there's polypharmacies. There was a lot of drug-drug interaction. Be careful about it. This de-intensification is very important, especially in the complex regimen and it's recommended to reduce the risk of hypoglycemia and consider the cost of therapy also because most of these patients are living alone, so therefore they might have to spend money from their pocket. The current comparison, um, current options for the glycemic control, the comparison is shown here, and what is shown here is the sulfonylurea and insulin have got a tremendous capacity to produce hypoglycemia, and therefore there is an increased glycemic variability as well. So therefore we should avoid liburide and glibenclamide in these patients and long-acting insulins are preferred compared to the short-acting or meal-related insulins. Metformin can cause GI symptoms, B12 deficiency, just be important, keep this in mind. It does not cause, of course, hypoglycemia. There are the cutoff values for GFR, stop it below 30 and continue up to 45 and may be beneficial in patients with coronary artery disease, avoid use in patients of heart failure and to avoid lactic acidosis. HGLT inhibitors, of course, are the no cures in the block. They have been excellent drug to predict, reduce, reduce the cardiovascular events and chronic kidney disease. Volume depletion is a concern in elderly population and also ketoacidosis. Be careful, be gradual. This is the cutoff value of 45% is the, is the old presentation, old uh, graph from this. And now because we have the GFR up to 25 is allowed, and reduces the major adverse cardiovascular events and congestive heart failure. Sulfonylureas are, of course, bad. So far, the weight gain concern, hypoglycemia, you need to use with caution, especially in chronic kidney disease. And cardiovascular disease, because of hypoglycemia, they can be erythmogenic and can induce stroke. Glitazons, of course, in the elderly population can have increased risk of fractures, though there's no hypoglycemia, of course. They do cause retention of fluid and weight gain. There's no adjustment dose in patients of chronic kidney disease, but do cause, they do cause retention of fluid and can increase risk of fractures. And use in patients with CVD, be very careful, especially because of retention of fluid. DP inhibitors are the drugs which do not cause hypoglycemia. They can be used, those reductions sometimes is necessary in patients of chronic kidney disease. If you're using other than venagliptin and tenigliptin, then you have to modify the dose. And patients with cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular disease, they are quite supposed to be safe and they have got a neutral result, except for saxagliptin, which is shown to increase risk of heart failure by 21%. They should not be used. Otherwise, these drugs are quite safe. 
they also have benefit in increasing the cognitive function they also have benefit in sarcopenia in these patients so they dp5 inhibitors are good drugs well tolerated in elderly population with that i conclude my talk thank you very much for the patient listening